Uh, we're we're going to be going through uh, several of the questions that came in. Uh, some other questions, too, that, that might come up that are relevant to it. Uh, we may not get to everybody's question. I just want to apologize in advance. It's uh, nothing personal, but we have only so much time, and uh, we want to make the most of it based on answers that we receive in this. Um, you know, first and foremost, we were talking at lunchtime, and that was an amazing story about the Titanic, was it not? Um, I'd never heard that story. How many of you had ever heard that story before about John Harper? Oh, a few of you. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. Business, would you tell kind of the, the origin? It was kind of an uh, interesting origin of how you found that story. Uh, would you like to share that with us? It's yeah. just a little soft opening here for, uh, for the Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was uh, actually November of 2020. I went back and found the specific article and it was in the morning, I was looking at the news headlines of the day. And on that particular day, I was scrolling through Fox News headlines of all the headlines. And uh, I don't normally feel very encouraged after I scroll through the headlines of any news website, including Fox News. It always is kind of depressing. But that particular day, November of 2020, there was an article there about a letter that had been discovered and was up for auction, written by, it said, hero pastor who died on the Titanic. And so it was actually an article in Fox News that introduced me to John Harper, and that got me so excited. I had a devotional moment there with Fox News, which, again, doesn't normally happen. <laughs> and... So I did a little bit more digging and I discovered that he was coming across on the Titanic actually to preach in the church that D.L. Moody had founded. So this was after Moody's death and home going to heaven, but it was 1912 that he was coming across to preach in Moody's church and instead God had a different pulpit that he wanted John Harper to preach from, which turned out to be a sinking ship. So it was from Fox News into more discovery about his life, and it was just an exhilarating discovery. So uh, that's how I that's how I came across the story. Of well, John I Harper. know I know that my allergies kind of flared up when you were telling that story, and um, <laughs> it's probably just the dust in here. But uh, <laughs> that was an incredible story, Pastor Manny. Um, obviously, uh, this subject matter and this series of conferences, Quorum Deo, it really connects to a passion in your heart. Uh, evident from your preaching on this this message, um, I have a kind of a twofold question. One that that we talked about beforehand was to tell your connection really to this, because I know that at one point you were headed to the priesthood, mm -hmm. and uh, and so that really intersects with with your passion on these subjects. And then I have a a, a quick follow up question uh, for that too. But I, I wanted to hear this this background, this story. Well. Yes, and yes, and yes. Um, I grew up as an altar boy. I served 11 years at the altar. I, for about six of those years, I was the only altar boy for our small church in a small community of 260 people. So the priests knew me well. All the people knew me well. I was considered a little angel. I did all the right things. I had all the external morality that anyone could have in town. I was praised by even the bishop. And yet, when I reached my teenage years, though I was morally clean on the outside, uh, sin raged within. And uh, I saw the bankruptcy of religion. Tried to work harder. Um, one of the intern priests uh, saw my zeal and said, well, why don't you come with me? He took me a personal tour in the monastery, St. Patrick's. I toured the dorms thinking, uh, this is where I'm going to go. Talked with the bishop. I thought I was going to be a priest my junior year of high school. 
that summer, my father took us to a Protestant church. A bit of a crisis took place in our family and uh, found myself in a, an Assemblies of God church and uh, for three months and only three months. And during that time, Christ was preached. And I, uh, I bowed the knee by sovereign grace. The end of the story is that uh, years passed by. I had, uh, we left that church and uh, I went back to Catholicism. Never had a mentor. Was not discipled. But I had a Bible. For the first time I had a Bible. A Protestant canon that I read and read and read. The thing fell apart three times over. I repaired it about two of those times with cereal boxes. Um, pages were falling out and... Uh, by the time I became a scientist and was working in this area, I actually uh, led a small group, 42 men, on a retreat, uh, and I naively thought, uh, well, you know, the things I've been reading in this Bible are upheld here in this historic, you know, stalwart of Christianity. And uh, while I'm listening to John MacArthur on the radio and all the rest, I, I just didn't see, I didn't know the difference. I, I thought, well... Clearly, there's, uh, there's some continuity. So long story short, and the end of it is that, um, at, that at that men's retreat, I actually dared to preach uh, John 14.6. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, to my face, uh, rebuked by the priest. And I was told that uh, there is another way. If you don't recall, John 14.6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. The priest stood up between, before me, and before 42 other men, and uh, young men, some of them, um, and said with no uncertain terms, there is another way. If you can't relate to God as a loving father, then he has provided a mother through which you can be saved. It was the last day I attended a Catholic church. I confronted him outside. Actually, he confronted me. And rebuked me in the open and said that I cannot and I never will be able to understand the scriptures. For that belongs to the magisterium in Rome. And that I have violated the church in its authority. And that I should quote Vatican documents more than I do the Bible. It's my story. In relation to sola fide, this was the last question that came in, and it, it kind of is an umbrella to everything here. And, and that is this question. It's very similar to the one that Dr. Thomas mentioned that he received at, at seminary. But what is faith in the sense of, please explain how it is required response to the gospel of Christ, yet not a work? Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, yes. What is faith? Exactly. In, in Roman Catholicism, I, I learned later, uh, I discovered uh, the teachings uh, not only of the scriptures and, and began to see their understanding more clearly, but, but I stumbled across the, the, the doctrine or the, uh, the history of the Reformation. So that lit a fire. I, I then realized, to answer the question, I then realized that uh, in Roman Catholicism, faith was part of my merit. It was something that I did that God would honor. And it was in itself a means of my attaining a standing. So this subject is very, very dear to my heart because I, this of course awakened in a different, but in some ways very similar, in an explosive revolutionary manner as Luther describes in his Tower Experience, that um, when I came to realize sola fide, it was as though the gates of heaven opened. And like Bunyan said, I, I saw my righteousness was not, was not in me, but in Christ. <laughs> and by his grace, he hasn't let me go. So I am so privileged to be able to uh, uh, have the, just the, stand in the shadow of these men and but preach Christ so 
Yes, <laughs> I hope that answered the question. Yeah, faith. Uh, we uh, one of the definitions was it. Uh, it's what we res what faith takes whatever yeah. grace gives. Amen. Your yeah, I, thank yeah. you. If I could just comment quickly Please. on this, yeah. so, so more directly to the question, then would be this: a, a looking away of self from self, right? A looking away from self. And uh, one of the things I think is so important in my effort to just draw attention to this was faith always makes much of its object. So to look in a way of self in the valuing and esteeming in the trust and confidence and boast of Christ and the gift that he gives us in his crucified work fully by grace. We receive it by faith alone. Excellent. Yes. The next question then would kind of give way to this, and this is to, to everyone here, whoever would like to jump in first. How do the solas connect? That was a question that, that came up as well, general question. How do these solas connect? There are five individual solas, and yet there's a chain. How would you explain that chain? Yeah, I, I would connect them going back to really the catalyst for the Reformation itself, which was a commitment to the headship of Christ as the Lord of the church. It was John Wycliffe and then John Huss after him who both championed at that time the radical idea that Christ alone is the head of the church, not the Pope. And if Christ is the head of the church, then his word is the authority for the church. That's sola scriptura. And if his word is the authority for the church, then the gospel that is found on the pages of Scripture is the true gospel, and it is a gospel of grace alone, sola gratia, through faith alone, sola fide, placed in the finished work, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, solus Christus. And if he did everything, and I did nothing, then I get none of the credit, which means soli deo gloria, all of the glory goes to God. And coming back to even the earlier question about faith and also repentance, both are gifts from God. Ephesians 2 says that faith is a gift. 2 Timothy 2 says that repentance is a gift. So there's no works. It's all a gift of his grace. Anybody like to add? Well, there's no, and, and I bow to you as the historian, but there's no point in history you know, like the 26th of October of 1523, when, when the church adopts the five solas of the Reformation. And it's, it, it evolves. I mean, there's a, there's a certain moment in time, and I, I just don't know when that is, when, when the first sort of statement of the five solas is made. You, you, can, you can see in Luther uh, and Calvin, but in Luther especially, um, passages where he mentions sola fide and sola gratia and solus Christus and, and, and sola scriptura and soli dea gloria. I mean, but they're not together cohesively as one, as one confessional entity called the five solas. And, and I, in my research, I've not been able to discover, you know, well, it was, it was after 1581 that the church would talk about the five solas. It seemed to evolve in, into it in some in some manner. But they were certainly embedded in the teachings of the magisterial reformers. That's good. Any other thoughts or connections on that? So then how would, you can give us uh, an understanding of the order salutis, the order of salvation. How does, how does that all fit together? Um, that's a, the doctrine of understanding of the the steps, if you will, of salvation. Uh, anybody want to expand on that? Especially in light of been talking about justification. Mm -hmm. Where does it fit? Well, I, I mean, um, you, you have uh, William Perkins, uh, you know, roughly around 1600, uh, who writes uh, an 800 page book on basically Romans 8, 29, and 30 uh, called The Golden Chain, uh, in which he takes the five items that Paul lists as a seminal 
uh, ordo salutis, that whom God hath foreordained, he is also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, and uh, whom he has uh, predestined, he is also called, and whom he has called, he justified, and whom he has justified, uh, he is also glorified. So you've got foreordination, predestination, calling, justification, and glorification. And, and I think that the church in the six, 15th and 16th century especially be, began, I mean in the 16th and 17th century especially, be, began to say that some things must logically and in some ways temporally come before other things. So the justification must come logically before sanctification. Justification must come logically before glorification. Um, now, one of the principal questions that in my world, when seminary students are licensed and they're, and they're going to presbytery and they're being examined for licensure and examined for uh, ordination, uh, they're, they're frequently asked the question, which comes first, faith or regeneration? Hmm. And if they say uh, faith, they are told uh, you can work as a people greeter in Walmart, but you will never be <laughs> a minister in this denomination. Because they have, they have just denied a principal category of understanding uh, divine monogism in, in salvation, that before you can exercise faith, you must be regenerate. Mm -hmm. you, you must be given the ability to believe. And, and so logically, if, if not... And those two things may not be able, you may not be able to dis distinguish those temporally, mm -hmm. but you can at least distinguish them logically. Right. Yeah, even coming back to your message this morning from Ephesians 2, those who are dead cannot respond unless they are first made alive. Mm -hmm. So regeneration must precede faith. Otherwise, to put faith first is to put the onus on human initiative, which is to rob God of his glory in salvation. So God is the one who initiates. And, and that logic is, it, it's inst it can be instantaneous. It's not like you're regenerated and then 10 years later you're justified, <laughs> right. Right? right? But it, in the logic of the order of what needs to happen in that moment, yeah. I was just going to comment very briefly. I think it also ties in with the concept of faith. If faith truly is a looking away of, from self and a trusting in its object, um, the, the natural man does not value Christ. Cannot. So for faith to be faith, it has to be able to see Christ. And it's the life, the regeneration that enables that. Right. Excellent. Drilling down into... Uh maybe a specific, the thief on the cross has been mentioned a couple times in a few of the messages. Mm -hmm. And so one of the questions was, uh, the thief is, is obviously an example of faith alone. And yet, how does that coincide with James 2.24? What is the evidence of that faith in the thief? Since there really wasn't a whole lot of time for him to show a lot of fruit. Um, well, he, he, did, uh, he did become a missionary. I think um, that you know we've how long have we got here? We've got two minutes, five minutes, thirty minutes. I mean, how long have we got between the the conversation with Jesus? It, it seems to me, in the context, that this is pretty last minute. Hmm. Uh, that he that he perceives that Jesus is dying, and this is his moment to ask him, uh, "Remember me when you come into your kingdom." Uh, and Jesus saying to him, today you shall be with me in paradise. But then there's a conversation between the dying thief uh, and the third person on the cross. And, and it appears to me that he's at least, I mean, first of all, uh, he has exercised faith, which, which is a fruit. Mm -hmm. He has genuinely displayed remorse and, and repentance for his sin. So, so that's a fruit. He, he, has, he has attempted to speak to the third person evangelistically, pleadingly. Hmm. So, so that's another fruit. And that's, that's a lot of fruit for somebody who only has two minutes to live. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Good, good answer. Good, good answer. answer. <laughs> Very good. Let's switch gears just a little bit here. 
Um, Dr. Crosby, yesterday you spoke and did a seminar on the connection between um, sola fide and social justice, and there's a couple of questions that have arisen from that. One of those comes with the, the differences between equality and equity. Let me read the question to you. It says, it appears that some advocates of the social justice movement have stated that achieving social equality is not the goal of the movement. Apparently, equality does not go far enough. Uh, the elite uh, who are driving the program demand the social equity be the goal. Since they are clearly willing to def redefine their own vocabulary, can we define, distinguish, and understand what they're actually saying when these words are used by the social justice advocates? Well, I think they're used in a number of senses. The, the idea of equality is that we all have uh, an equal opportunity. We all have maybe the same starting place. You know, we, in our own country, you have equality under the law. And there's this sense that, you know, even you go back to founding documents that the, innate, the creator, you know, endowed us with certain inalienable rights. Um, the equity side of it is they want you to have the same outcome. And the, the great deception of all that, and it's satanic, is that um, they define what that means. The, the, the goalpost always shifts, and without getting too much into the whole uh, intersectional totem pole, uh, depending on, the, the goalpost is always moving, and so they're always redefining what equity is, and I believe the goal is to divide, the goal is to oppress, uh, and, uh, and to hold individual souls and consciences hostage. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an insincere, uh, deceptive uh, term that has that's totally subjective. You know, uh, when you look at it, if, if I am a white straight man, I'm at the bottom. Uh, I am an oppressor. I'm a member of multiple oppressive groups: white, straight, ma male. Uh, and then if I am a, uh, a, a an African American lesbian. Um, I am a member of multiple oppressed groups. But what happens is, is you keep changing positions and there's, there's, no, cha there's no chance for equity. It's a fool's errand and it's intended to destroy. That's Satan, right? Uh, he's a, he was a liar from the beginning. He's a murderer and he wants to destroy. And, and this is a very much a satanic tool uh, that really goes back to the garden where you have this, this statement, hath God really said, you know, it... it cast out any, any biblical category and elevates man-centered principles to godlike status. Anyone else want to contribute? Well, there, there was an article in the paper yesterday, which I briefly read since I was delayed for 27 hours. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was a professor, I forget which university, but who had given a lecture like the day before on um, the oppressed group of left-handers. Mm. <laughs> I don't know whether you read that. And I thought, okay, we are just completely nuts. <laughs> the world is just nuts right now. And we need to stick to preaching the gospel, not, yes. not social gospel. Yes. And, yeah. and that wasn't parody. I, I saw the article yeah. as well. That was a legitimate, or legitimate claim, I should say. <laughs> not a legitimate uh, era there out there. But if you're any left-handed here, we're, I know that at one point in history you were considered demonic, I believe, uh, because you used a different hand. So at least those days are over, right? So take comfort in that. <laughs> so I hope, maybe. <laughs> Danny, I know you're left-handed, so yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, n another social justice uh, question that came up from that, that was inspired by that, and that is a question that went something like this, that recently church helped uh, on a missions trip through Associated Missionary by providing some of the basic necessities uh, that people required. Um, so is this merely social justice or, or is, is there a place in Christian work and Christian missions and local missions where we, we do help the needy, we do provide things for them and it not be social justice? Yeah, well, you, uh, and as I mentioned yesterday, you know, the church has always helped the weak. It is the overflow of genuine saving faith that we show compassion to people. It never occludes or eclipses the gospel. Uh, we know that what, when we do good things for people, that we're not going to save them. 
And so whether it's the first century church uh, rescuing abandoned babies, whether it's the uh, proto-deacons in Acts chapter 6, you know, distributing food to the widows, uh, it's always been that way. And so, no, I don't, I don't think meeting needs uh, that others have out of a genuine concern of a regenerate heart is uh, anything isn't necessarily social justice as, it's, is, is the, as the moniker is used today. And I, I just think there's a place for glorifying Christ, doing good to others, doing what you do for the glory of God, the good of others, and when it stretches you out your own growth. I just think when it somehow, when we flip the priorities or when we, we invert the, the priorities, I think it's almost always dam- it's always damaging. Mm-hmm. But yeah, helping other people is a good thing. I mean, when I, if somebody has a flat tire and I help them, I mean, I hope to get a chance to evangelize them. I might not always, you know. But. Any other contributions to that? Yeah. Just a quick comment. I, then it's important for us to remember that the term social justice had a different meaning mm-hmm. um, just a few decades ago, really, but mm-hmm. technically, uh, last uh, in, in in the nineteenth century, it had a very different. It had a it had a genuine meaning. Mm-hmm. It's been hijacked. Right. Mm-hmm. So the, the the phrase today doesn't mean what it used to mean. So when you read Spurgeon or the Puritans, mm-hmm. and you might see uh, at least an allusion to that idea, it's genuine. That's Christians should be concerned, should be a light. Hospitals, orphanages, Absolutely. soup kitchens. These are all Christian realities, and. Uh, let me just say one last, Wilberforce. Mm-hmm. Amen. You know, I minister in a downtown church. I'm two blocks away from the the um, the um, what am I two blocks away from? <laughs> <laughs> the 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 place where legislation is done for the state, uh, the, state the capital, house. The capital. state house. Sorry, it's been a long day. <laughs> Uh, so, so the, the issue of poverty, you know, is is outside the door and sometimes inside the door. Mm. And we were inundated with with this issue that was occupying way too much of our time. So, ten churches in the area uh, came together to form an organisation just to help those who have desperate needs. They need they need 150 bucks to pay for their electricity bill. Otherwise, they're going to get evicted. And then it's a spiral down into homelessness. So if you can just get them past the crisis, you know, and so on. And we thought this was a legitimate need, and it was taking way too much time uh, of the church. So we formed a, a sort of parachurch thing. And I thought, I, I need to sit on the board of this thing um, as my contribution uh, to, to help. Um, and it's a legit. I mean, the, the church has always been involved in social issues. Mm-hmm. Christians adopting abandoned babies in the Roman Empire in the second century. Second century. We, we had Wilberforce on slavery and child labor in 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 coal mining. Um, so that's nothing new. But it, the the problem now is that you can't use words like equity, which actually are, the word equity is in the Westminster Confession, mm-hmm. uh, but it means something entirely different. Uh, but when I quoted the, this confession in a sermon, just you know, general mm. equity thereof. Oh, an email came hot and heavy uh, that I was I was giving in to sort of wokeism and so on. So so we're living in a in a day and age where 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 people are easily triggered uh, about about definitions which may have changed from you know most of us are quoting literature from centuries ago, and a lot of Christian jargon, unless you're a skinny jean hipster preacher a lot of christian jargon you know is centuries old but uh, but today the, the words have different meanings so it's it, it's become way more complicated yeah. so the w- westminster confession is still okay it's not a woke document <laughs> okay good clarity there they did wear tight fitting you know leggings they so. did yeah that was <laughs> so. any comment on the history of the leggings or <laughs> No, but I would, I would say this about social justice. Um, the second great commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And so Christian charity and acts of Christian charity flow out of our desire to honor and serve Christ. Yes. The issue is when 
the mission begins to change and the message begins to change and the motivation begins to change, right? Because our mission is defined by the Great Commission and our message is the gospel and it's a gospel of individual reconciliation between the sinner and the Savior. And the motivation for that is to see sinners become worshipers of Christ so that in fulfilling the second great commandment, we lead them to fulfill the greatest commandment, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Mm -hmm. So where social justice goes askew is in changing each of those three aspects of what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus. Yes. Yeah, the, the thought of orphanages and hospitals that bear the name of, of Christian denominations as a testimony to the gospel and caring is a long tradition um, within uh, Christianity, mm. whether they are still doing that today, d- despite their origin, like many of the, the seminaries that began in our country and mm. others. So, excellent. Let's switch gears a little bit um, to uh, the Dark Ages. Um, here's a question. Uh, directed to you, Dr. Buzinitz, since the gospel was being preached throughout the Dark Ages, what events occurred that, or event that brought about the Reformation? Was it the ruling influence of the Catholic Church? Was it the status, what was the status of Christianity at that time? Was there a, a defining, we, we obviously know some of the defining moments, but was it just Luther all by himself against everybody else, or what, what are some of the keys to that? Yeah, that's a good question. It's not an easy question to answer succinctly, um, but I'll do my best. My kids, I have four teenagers. When people ask me, how can we pray for you? I say, I have four teenagers. Um, <clears throat> but my kids always roll their eyes a little bit whenever somebody asks me a question like that because they know the answer is always going to be long. <laughs> but I will do my best to keep it short. <laughs> the Roman Catholic movement became an apostate movement. An apostate movement is a movement in which the truth once existed, but over time, through the elevation of the traditions of men, the gospel becomes obscured and the truth is lost. That same thing happened in Old Testament Israel, which is why Jesus confronted the scribes and Pharisees in Mark chapter 7 and said to them, rebuked them for elevating the traditions of men above the word of God. Apostasy is always a gradual reality. Now, at a certain point, you reach the point of no return, but the apostatization of Christendom in Western Europe is something that occurred, I would say, starting in the 4th century, the seeds of corruption were sown when the Roman Empire became Christian, when Constantine converted to Christianity, and later when Theodosius declared Rome to be a Christian empire. And Calvin would look, in looking back on that, would say that the empire was baptized without being converted. It was many who were just nominal in their Christianity, and they brought into Christendom many of their pagan practices. Calvin himself details this in a treatise uh, on relics that he wrote in the 16th century. So the seeds of corruption are really sown in the 4th century, and they bear the fruit of corruption all throughout the Middle Ages, and you would almost have to trace each individual tradition, things about the elevation of Mary and things about the development of purgatory and the development of the priesthood and the development of a sacramental system. And all of these things grow in terms of obscuring influences so that the gospel within Western Christianity is significantly obscured. If we're looking for a point of no return, Historians disagree on this, evangelical historians, but uh, Norm Geisler and Josh Betancourt in their book, Rome, uh, on Rome, Is It the True Church? They identify the Fourth Lateran Council. I mentioned it a few times in my messages. The year 1215 under Innocent III as being the point of no return because it was there that Rome officially dogmatized the sacramental system. And once you dogmatize the sacramental system, you have officially introduced a works-based version of attaining salvation. Now that's quite late, that's 1215, that's the 13th century. But when we get to Luther, Luther looks back to Bernard in the 12th century and to Anselm in the 11th century and to others and groups them all, he calls them all church fathers, as those who were still faithful in terms of being a remnant in their witness to the truth. 
Now, they're not always as consistent or as clear as we would like, but I do think we see glimpses of the true gospel still in their writings. And so what's encouraging to me is to know that already by the 13th century, we have groups that are called the forerunners to the Reformation or pre-reformers, like the Valdensian movement and then John Wycliffe and the Lollard movement and John Huss and the Hussite movement, all of which anticipate the Reformation. So to the end part of your question, was it just Luther? Luther would have answered that question by saying no. He would have said that on two fronts at least. Number one, he would have said he wasn't the first, that he was standing on the shoulders of Huss and Wycliffe before him. And in fact, there's a, an emblem at the University of Prague that shows John Wycliffe gathering, kindling, and John Huss lighting a uh, spark, and then H Luther holding the torch that he has lit at their fires. And I think historically that's accurate. But if you really asked Luther what is responsible for the Reformation, I believe he would have answered it by saying the word of God is responsible for the Reformation. In fact, at the end of his life, he said, I've done nothing but to teach and preach the word of God. I've done nothing. The word has done everything. Mm -hmm. And that's because the catalyst in any Reformation, whether it's all the way back in 2 Chronicles 33 to 35 with Josiah, or whether it's the book of Acts, or whether it's the Reformation, or the evangelical revival in England, or the Great Awakening, anytime you have a true revival, the catalyst for it is always the Spirit of God using his word to transform one heart at a time. Mm -hmm. Amen. Great answer. I'll, <laughs> I'll tell your kids. That, uh, you great on that. Uh, since you're on a roll, uh, let me uh, ask this question. This was directed to you as well. Uh, you mentioned that the reform reformers were able to access the Greek and Hebrew texts bypassing the Latin inter interpretations. Does that mean there was a period of time in church history where the average man did not have, or one, did not have access to an accurate interpretation of the gospel or the whole Bible? Well, the, most of the people living in either Western Europe or even Eastern Europe, but especially in Western Europe, for most of church history, did not have access to education at all. So they were entirely dependent on their local priest to articulate what to believe. In terms of the Latin language, it was Jerome all the way back in the 5th century who translated the Latin Vulgate, so actually late 4th century, early 5th century, so the late 300s and the early 400s. And the word Vulgate actually means common. It was translated into Latin so that the people who spoke Latin in the western half of the Roman Empire could have the word of God in their own language. And it's a fairly good translation. It went through several editions throughout the Middle Ages, and unfortunately, the Roman Catholic Church held captive the word of God in Latin when people in Western Europe no longer spoke Latin. And so you get into the high Middle Ages and the late Middle Ages, and suddenly people don't speak Latin anymore, but the only Bible that they ever hear when they go to church or to Mass is Latin. And so the Word of God was held prisoner uh, in the Latin language. And what the Reformation is all about, even starting with the the pre-reformers. I mean, the Valdensians translated the Bible into the Piedmontese dialects where they lived. Uh, Wycliffe was the first to translate the Bible along with others at Oxford from the Latin into English. And then Huss preaches in Prague in the Bohemian language. Luther then translates the Bible. In fact, 500 years ago this year, Luther began his translation of the New Testament from the Greek into German. A few years later, 1525, William Tyndale from the Greek into English. And the result is that the word of God is now accessible in a language people can understand. And the result is revival Amen. because the word of God never returns void. Amen. Excellent. Dr. Thomas, let's uh, switch gears to you. This is a question uh, regarding uh, someone was evangelizing a Muslim and their comment was that um, if, if God was really just, he would not send his son to die, but he would die himself. And of course, there's the understanding that it's hard for him to see that, that the son is God. Could you tell, uh, how would you explain to address such a question without distorting the beauty and majesty of the triune God? 
Well, since that's a really difficult question, let me divert it to another. Um, <laughs> and say, and say how, how wonderful it is that Manny did not become a Roman Catholic priest. Mm. Um, <laughs> I, I think part of the problem with this is uh, that Islam has no understanding and, and no liking for uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. So in Islam, Islam believes that Muhammad uh, is an undifferentiated monad. Now, I remember being in church in Jackson, Mississippi, back, I'm guessing, the, you know, 2005, 6, 7, 8, somewhere around there. I was the evening preacher. Ligon Duncan was the morning preacher. And, and in the middle of his sermon, you know, suddenly he stops and he leans over the pulpit and he says, God is not an undifferentiated monad. And there was total silence. And then there were women going to their handbags and p pulling out pieces of paper and pen, and they were writing this down. God is not. They had no idea what he was saying. I mean, none whatsoever. I remember going to uh, dinner at the house of a lady who actually died this year uh, for dinner. And on the fridge, there it was. God is not an undifferentiated monad. Now, the expression comes out of uh, Trinitarian discussions uh, back in the 4th century, uh, around the time of the Nicene uh, and Niceno-Constantinopolitan creeds of 325-381, uh, arguing that there is only one God, but there, there, there are three who are that one God. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but there is only one God. Now, a second problem, I think, for, th for this is um, th that it is not God the Son who dies, right? He doesn't die. His deity doesn't die. It is the human nature of Jesus that dies. The divine nature of Jesus is incapable of death. It is the human nature, and, and the human nature, and Chalcedon in 451 address the issue of the relationship between the two natures of Christ, the divine nature and, and human nature. Now, let, let me, so, so those are the technical things that, that make this question, you know, really difficult, especially for a Muslim. Um, it is impossible, I would go out on a limb and say, it is impossible for the Father to become incarnate. In the economy of the Trinity, only, only the Son can become incarnate. Only the Son can take on uh, human flesh in, in hypostatic union with his divine nature. Uh, that, that, is, that is a necessary economy of the Trinity. So, so the terms in which the question is asked um, is entirely based on, on the inconceivability of the economy of the Trinity. I think, I think that's, that's the problem. Um, so I wouldn't even attempt to answer the question to a Muslim in the way that I've just answered it, by the way. I'm just, I'm just saying, I, I, think, I, think, I think you need to evangelize a Muslim with the reality of who Jesus is and that he's more than just a human person. He certainly is a human person and he dies. It's the human nature of Jesus that dies, but his divine nature doesn't, doesn't die. I mean, at some point in history, the divine nature of Jesus is in hypostatic union mm -hmm. with a corpse. Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and, and I can say that, and I, but, but I have no real understanding of what it is I'm saying. But I'm, <laughs> I'm absolutely certain that it is true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, second. I'm going to sec that. Yeah, second. That's, that's good. <laughs> Excellent. I want to switch gears, and this will... This will be a series of at least three questions for all of you um, uh, in regard to kind of the ongoing practical implications of sola fide in the in the day to day life. Um, here's I'm going to go with this question first. How do you keep your faith in Christ's righteousness focused and energized without losing your faith to discouragement and constant trials and temptations? Mm -hmm. Not to oversimplify, but 
by knowing no other Christ than the one that is represented in the scriptures. Uh, his character, his goodness, his sovereignty, uh, his, uh, for lack of a better terminology, sympathy and empathy with humankind as he took on flesh. And to remember that he was tempted, and I hate to use that word tempted in all ways, such as we were, and that uh, he doesn't call me to do anything of, of any scale, uh, anything close to what he experienced or suffered on my behalf. God is good. He will always be good. He always has been good. And uh, he has done for me far more than I would ever consider doing for myself, uh, being unwilling and unable to come to him on my own. And uh, that enables me to live a life of gratitude regardless of situation or circumstance. Amen. Anyone like to contribute to that? Staying focused and energized without losing faith to discouragement, temptation, constant trials. Yeah, I'm not sure I understood the question, but if I if I did understand it, I I would want to say two things, I think. That one or maybe three things. One you know, preach the gospel to yourself every day. Yes. Yes. And preaching the gospel to yourself every day reminds you that you are a sinner. Mm -hmm. uh, Simul just says at Bacato, you're a justified sinner, but you're still a sinner. Mm -hmm. uh, re remember, too, uh, that it is through many tribulations that we enter the kingdom of God. It's a basic tenet that Paul learned after his first missionary journey. Uh, don't be surprised when... Uh, uh, all kinds of trials, uh, poikilos, uh, multi-variegated trials overtake you, uh, James 2. We're all in the same boat. There are good days and bad days, uh, but you, you need to focus and keep your eye on, on Jesus. Uh, it's the admonition or exhortation of the opening chapters of Hebrews. You know, Keep your eye fixed on Christ. Every day. Um, and you're not alone. Uh, I mean, you're not alone. The church is filled with people who are discouraged by the lack of progress in sanctification. But that, that is not a, 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 um, a stratagem that says, then why should I bother? Um, you, you know, keep short accounts with God. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, confess your sins, ask forgiveness. Tomorrow's a new day. Amen. Um, I think that's, that's the sort of trajectory that I would take. I would thank, thank you, Dr. Thomas, for that. I, I, I recall what he said in his message, um, the last message in Romans 6, counted. You know, so I just simply... The, the discipline of the mind. Um, we, we talk a great deal about discipline. We talk about discipline and we typically think it externally. Something we have to discipline a behavior. But, but my Lord says that, that every evil comes from my mind, from my heart, from within. So why would I be in the business of disciplining something on the outside when it's driven by what's inside? And I'm not disciplining that? And I think that my point is simple, that uh, it's exactly what we've heard today so wonderfully. And that is, uh, and Dr. Thomas just said it, uh, every morning, I, I, preach to yourself. Preach the glories of Christ. Um, remind yourself. It's a discipline. Every time, uh, many things, uh, I'll stop here, but <laughs> um, thoughts will come to us that we are not necessarily responsible for, that they come to us. But we are always responsible for how we respond. And so we need to be disciplined in how we respond to the thoughts that come to us, to the circumstances that present themselves to us, to whatever it is, by image or sensation, by feeling or just thought. What we do in response will either honor Christ or not. And by honoring Christ, choosing to discipline that thought and say, no, I'm not going to go there. 
I'm going to look to Christ. That is faith. Now, this, this may be the same question, but said in a different way. But I think there's some uniqueness to it. What if sin has had a, a dominion over you, despite the fact that you're a believer, and maybe it, it's, go on, it's gone on for a prolonged time, maybe multiple decades? What does this say about one's faith? What does this say about justification? Is it authentic? Is it not? How do you wrestle with a question like that? Well, f first of all, this could be an indication of apostasy. I mean, you have to reckon on that. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present evil world. It didn't happen overnight. It, it became a habit. It became a lifestyle. And eventually he drifted away. And I think the New Testament seems to indicate he was apostate, his faith was never genuine. I think that's, that's one possibility. A, a second possibility is what the Old Testament prophets would often call backsliding. Um, that you can be a Peter, but you can have a period in your life when you deny the Lord Jesus three times to his face. You can commit this horrendous sin. And that, that's poss and that, and that somebody of the caliber of the apostle Peter can, can do that. Uh, you, you can have an apostle Paul, uh, godly as he was, writer of 13 uh, New Testament letters as he was, but he had no time for John Mark once John Mark had quit mm. uh, from his first missionary journey. Thank God for Barnabas. Mm. Now, in 2 Timothy, a swan song, John Mark and Paul have, have, have made up. That's a that's a beautiful thing to see. Um, but Paul was a difficult man to work for. I, I would not want to play second fiddle to the Apostle Paul. He, he was right about everything. He had opinions about everything. He was type A. Uh, yeah, give me the Apostle John uh, anytime. Um, so I, I, I think there's probably a range. If, if, if somebody has fallen into... And I think that the reformers and... and, and, and Puritans believed that the pattern of sanctification, of mortifying sin and uh, mortification and vivification, putting sin to death and, 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 and growing the fruits of this or demonstrating the fruits of the Spirit, I mean, that, that pattern was a medieval pattern. There were things at the Reformation that were radically different from the medieval age. Sanctification was not one of them. Uh, and and the the role of habit in sin is is one that me medieval theologians Aquinas talks about it. Uh, uh, certainly, the Puritans talked about it. If if you've if you've allowed yourself to fall into a pattern of sin for days, weeks, months, years, um, it's going to be difficult to break that. And you're going to have to take if you're serious about being holy you're going to have to take radical measures. You're going to have to cut off uh, right arms and pluck out right eyes. That's how radical it's going to, it's going to be according to uh, Jesus. And that means somebody who has uh, an addiction to pornography, uh, you may have to think about, about quitting your, your phone and cutting your internet service. I mean, that's radical. But, but I, I remember somebody coming into my office and saying, and, and, and they had... Addiction with pornography, and uh, they wanted to stop it. And I said, "Well, how how radical do you want to be?" And he says, "I, I want to be radical. Then come with me down to the bottom of Gervais Street, uh, and let's throw your phone into the river." Hmm. It wasn't happening. And I said, "When you're ready to do that, come back and see me, because until you're ready for that, there's nothing I can do for you." Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, you know, and there are various things. I mean, having an accountability partner, having somebody call you every morning and every evening to, and make you accountable to break that habit. And that, and that may take weeks. It may take months. Actually, it may take years. It actually may take the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. But it will be a commitment as to how genuinely serious you are yeah. about wanting to be holy. As Owen famously says, be killing sin or it be killing you. Yeah. 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 That's great. 
in relation to those two questions, then the previous one, what is the relationship between Christian assurance and the, the evidence of salvation? Is there a connection? What is the connection? How does this play into walking in faith and, and being justified? Yeah, I think there, there is a connection. Um, we see in the scriptures both an objective element of assurance and a subjective element of assurance. The objective element of assurance is that God promises that those who entrust themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved, right? So the objective side of assurance is Romans 10 promises that if we confess Jesus as Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. So there is the objective promise of the gospel, and that promise is objectively true. It's there in the, the black letters of your Bibles. The subjective side of assurance is what even Dr. Thomas has emphasized a couple of times this weekend. It is the fruit Right, Matthew 7, Jesus said that you will know them by their fruit. Matthew 13, the parable of the soils. The good soil, which represents a heart that is truly receptive to the gospel, the good soil bears or produces lasting fruit. And even the, the epistle of 1 John is all about the tests of life, and there are doctrinal tests and there are moral tests. But this has to do with looking at the fruit of your life so that you can look at your life and, and ask yourself, are there evidences of a heart that loves the Lord? Because Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And it's not that we're perfect. It's Sanctification is progressive. We're not glorified yet. But do you see an evidence of a desire to be pleasing to Christ, even as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, we make it our ambition to be pleasing to Christ. Is there evidence of that in how you live? So objectively, if you believe, you will be saved. Subjectively, if you're truly saved, there will be fruit. It's, a, it's actually a tricky question because in church history, uh, you know, this, this has been the question that has led to legalism. Mm. Uh, you, you know, take First John, and I, I tell seminary students, don't preach on First John in the first ten years of your ministry. You'll sound like a legalist. Mm. Uh, you know, um, what is the evidence of our of our of our profession of faith that you love one another? Let's just take that. So, if you if you pursue that, what is the what is the uh, what is the evidence? On what basis may I be assured of my salvation? It's it's me. Right? It's my love for one another. It's, it, it's my adherence to the truth. And then all of a sudden, the basis of assurance is me. No, the basis of my assurance is my relationship to Christ. Right? So it's very easy to, to, to read First John and end up a legalist. And I think it's very important that we understand Romans 6 before we understand First John that the basis of my assurance is that I have died to sin and I've been raised to newness of life. I have died to my old Adamic self and I'm now a man in Christ. That I've been buried, resurrected, and I'm sitting with Christ in the heavenly places. That's the basis of my assurance. And from that will flow evidentiary good works but, but, but if, I, if I flip them round, I'm going to end up in legalism. Amen. I think a compliment to that, a, a demonstration of that, is it right there in Philippians um, chapter 2, when, or chapter 3, right after Paul wrestles with that um, justification that it's apart from him, that the, he's received the righteousness of God that depends on faith. Then he moves into this statement where he says, not that I've already attained it, not that I've already arrived at the final end, not that I've already, but, but he doesn't point to works or evidentiary um, deeds as his assurance. Instead, he says this, he says, but one thing I do, that's, a, that's an exclusive concept. He's saying, these are not the things I do for my, for, as a result. Instead, one thing I do, 
I press on. And, and there's a sense in which the assurance comes in right here where he says, I press on. Essentially this, to lay hold of what I have already been laid hold of. It's in his mind, he's motivated as with a singular drive because of the sovereign grace of God. And that Christ has laid hold of him is the ground of his assurance. In other words, he will press on as the greatest athlete to strive to cross the finish line. And the fact that he does is what he's rejoicing in. He's teaching them. He's teaching the Philippians. This is where you need to be. It's in the heart. Your heart wants to keep going. There's... There's the issue, looking away from yourself to Christ every day. There's assurance from my heart. Every time I'm able, by the grace of God, to look away to Christ, I know that's assurance to me. I'm not looking at my works. I'm looking at the fact that I still see him as glorious. And the one thing I do is press on. It's complimented in Colossians 3, where it starts with, set yes. your mind on things above, where Christ is seated, yes. put to death, put off, yes. put on comes after that yeah yeah that's good but at the end of the day our assurance is based on the trustworthiness of god amen right amen. i mean no it's not subjective i mean there are people you know who come into our offices with you know the crisis of the week and 15 times in 15 days and they're always worried about their assurance of salvation yeah. and that's a can be a good thing but at the end of the day it really comes down to it, god is faithful amen so to heighten just a bit here then, um, this question, I'm going to kind of summarize it this way, in that faith plus something else has infiltrated, obviously, the liberal church, Roman Catholicism. But how have you seen, as, as pastors and theologians, have you seen this faith plus something else infiltrate conservative churches and churches that, that are maybe in, in our sphere of, uh, of belief, reformed churches, um, conservative churches, biblical churches, uh, how, how have you seen that and, and how do we guard against that? Well, yes, um, <clears throat> the, you know, the, there are lots of them. There's faith plus a certain level of Christian maturity and zeal. Uh, that that completely obscures the fact that um, the New Testament, you know, recognizes uh, people of little faith and people of great faith, and it's not the quality of your faith that matters. Spurgeon once said that faith, as thin as a spider's thread, so long as that thread is fixed to Christ, is saving faith. <laughs> Uh, we've got we've got parts of our reformed community that say, uh, you know, it's faith, but it's but it's also faith in in issues that are not first of all. You know, and Paul makes a distinction in First Corinthians uh, twice in First Corinthians in First Corinthians eleven and First Corinthians fifteen that there are things that are first of all and the things that are second of all. There are primary doctrines without which you can't be a Christian. But there are also secondary doctrines that we may disagree about, but, but they're not essential for saving faith. Right? So a lack, of, a lack of being able to distinguish between what is primary and what is secondary can, can lead to a faith plus. Mm -hmm. The damnable plus, as Luther mm -hmm. called it. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Comments on that? As we wind down our time um, and we go out from here and we've been given a, a full heart and a full mind of excellent theology, understanding of the scriptures on this central doctrine, what are some recommendations you have uh, for further reading, uh, or maybe we still have books left, but uh, maybe there's some <laughs> things that you've been influenced by that, that you would want to say for further study, 
for further development, for further growth and love in Christ in regard to this general sola fide, what, what would you recommend? Well, since I mentioned Martin Lloyd-Jones, um, you know, if you can't afford to buy the 13 volumes uh, of um, his exposition of uh, Romans, buy the, vol the volume that includes the sermons on Romans 3, 23 through Romans 4, uh, where Paul deals with justification by faith alone. Uh, and, and I read them uh, back in the early 1970s. It was the first volume that came out, uh, and, and they didn't do chapters 2 and chapters 1 until, until actually at the end. Um, but they remain, for me, some of the most... And because they're sermons, that they're... They're transliterated sermons. So when you read them, it sounds like somebody's speaking to you or preaching to you. So, so they're, not, they're not technical in the way that books on justification can very quickly get technical, especially dealing with um, new perspective issues. Mm -hmm. um, but if you simply want a confirmation of what is at the heart and core of the gospel, I, I, I would recommend that volume. I read it quite often. Yeah, I would recommend the preface to Martin Luther's own commentary on Romans, in which he expounds even upon his testimony. It was the reading of that preface that God used to actually reach John Wesley uh, at the beginning of the evangelical uh, revival. And then... Certainly some of the works of the Puritans, uh, George Whitfield's testimony, uh, where God used the writings of a man named Henry Scugel, the life of God and the soul of man, to help Whitfield understand that true spiritual life is not about externalism, it's about the internal reality of regeneration and being born again. Um, so there are some great works from centuries ago that don't actually require any purchases because the public domain on those is, mm -hmm. is why I love teaching church history. Everything's free on the internet. <laughs> so um, I encourage you to find some of those things. There's some wonderful treasures. I would add John Owen. It's one of the, it's truly just edifying, very profound. He dealt with neo-nominism, which is a new law kind of concept. And if you you might want to search that out. There were some challenges at that time with some of the Puritans. And, but uh, Owen, it, it caused him, it required him to articulate it with such profound clarity. And um, it's, you might think it's outdated. It's still an issue. And so his articulation is helpful. I would just add two um, very readable, even though they were written a long time ago. One is and I may be having a senior moment, I think it's called Old Paths by J.C. Raw. And then Holiness, something we forget a lot about these yes. days by J.C. Raw. Amen. Very good. Thank you for that. Yeah. Do you want to show your appreciation to these four men from... <laughs>